did is we, we looked at these existing conditions and we looked at their energy budgets here in terms of energy they use annually based on utility bills. And here's the blue building and here's the brick building. See the brick building is very long, it's got west facing exposure. And we did a little energy audit. And the energy audit was basically to identify opportunities to save energy in these buildings. And so we, I did the energy audit actually, and we saw lots of horrors, including old thermostats that don't work and things I don't even understand anymore that used to be controlling the radiators. Um, <laughs> some very dirty old radiators up here. And we identified opportunities to save energy. And we said, well, which, you know, this was kind of our first pass. You know, what's the relative energy savings versus the relative cost? And we kind of started bucketing these things into groups of measures that we might see that trying to implement over time. Uh, here's a few more. So we did it for both buildings, the blue building and the, and the brick building. And then we, did a, we created a calibrated energy model. Uh, we didn't use eQuest, we could have. So we had the energy data, the monthly energy data, so we could actually do, take a swing at the calibration, which is not easy to do. But if we could get an energy model that more or less matches the energy use of the existing building, then we start applying those measures again so we can see what the, what's going to do for us. And so then we look at buckets of different measures. So like once a small measure, or a small intervention would be like weather stripping windows and doors, insulate the exterior wall cavity, and then insulate the attic space and the roof, or basically the attic space. And then you could have a, a medium measures where you do all those things plus more things. Since so we want to see you know, what those would cost, what would get, how far that would get us towards net zero. And so don't bother try to squint on the spreadsheet, but here's our, our base scenario, which is a calibrated small, medium, and large with various and the two different building types. And we figured out total energy that they would use, and then we figured out how much PV we'd need to offset that to be net zero. And so, uh, back here. so what we came up with is you need four million dollars a square feet for the base building, four million dollars and thirty-nine thousand square feet of PV to be net zero if you don't do anything. So of course, they don't have that much money, and nor do they have that much space. So that's sort of was just kind of the point of reference. So here, for we're looking at the total energy use now of the brick and the blue buildings and these different measures. And you can see if we incorporate all the measures, we can get the energy down to this. Thought of let me get to the next slide. Thought of another way. Here's the blue building, and that's how much you would need if you just implemented a few measures, a small production scenario. And this is how much PV you would need the entire parking lot offset the energy used in this building if you just do the small number of measures. If you get more aggressive and you do more energy conservation measures, the medium, this is how much the PV becomes for the brick building, and this is how much PV you need for the blue building. Still quite a bit. If you get the most aggressive, you get you need this much. So you can see that you know you, you're still that's I mean where are you gonna put that? And they were talking about doing awnings in the parking or a lot if you could get it, but that's still a lot of money. And that was kind of the exercise we went through. So this was a conception of saying, well, we can put them here, we can put them here, we can put them here. Those are our geothermal holes, we'll convert to geothermal, and maybe we can make that work. So they don't have the money for this, but it was kind of an interesting exercise that just showed kind of how you might approach doing that kind of analysis. Uh, for, for office buildings, uh, I think you get the idea now is that if you have a one floor office building, the amount of roof area you have relative to the amount of energy is a little easier to hit net zero energy than if you have a six story office building. It's much, much harder to hit net zero because you don't have any place to put your PV. So my point's a controversy and I'm going to be done in three minutes. That gives people enough time. Um, so here's a question. Does net zero energy encourage sprawl? Would it be easier to net, hit net zero with all these little buildings down here than this one? And the answer is yes, if you're only thinking about an individual building. This arguably uses less energy per person than it does than these do. Here you've got people driving to and from work. Here maybe they're commuting. So this is probably the better choice Yet if you want to make net zero for your building, this might be the better choice. Uh, so another question we ask is, does net zero energy goal just shift the usage away? So let's say we like to have showers at work. Do they use domestic hot water? Well, we can't hit net zero energy for the building if we have showers. So we'll just make people take their showers at home. So what have you really accomplished? Someone's still taking a shower at home. Maybe they're using their shower longer with a less efficient source than if they put a shower in with the ground source heat pump at work. So you're not hitting net zero energy, but Maybe you're more environmentally sensitive to put the showers at work anyways. Um, maybe you just say, hey, you can only brown bag at work. We're not going to let you cook anything you know, for lunch. You can't heat up anything. <laughs> um, you know, if you get Nazi, like, you know, 5 o'clock, lights out, equipment turns off, Ooh, we got a switch, it's going down. <laughs> you know, you might say, gee, we'll just do more telecommuting. So is telecommuting better or worse? If you got someone at home all day, they probably are using more energy because they've got stuff on, you know, than if they're in their workspace, workspace in a very efficient building. 
So then you say, all right, what about the cost of commuting back and forth in terms of an energy impact? So you, kinda, you have to do those kind of calculations as well. And then what about embodied energy? Is that a term you guys have thought about? Yeah. <laughs> so what's the energy involved in baking the building, essentially, that's embodied in the materials, in producing those materials, and in building the building? And again, are you, you know, how do you account for that? And that's a really tough one. Uh, so one of the, the things we talk about is scale jumping. And if you start to talk about net zero from a community size scale or a neighborhood size scale, all of a sudden things become more possible sometimes than for an individual building. So if you have a data center next door, maybe you can get all the heat you need from the data center, you don't need it. You know, things like that. Looking for ways you can find synergies in the buildings. Or if you have a warehouse next door that uses almost no energy, maybe that becomes your PV, PV farm for the residents next door to that. Uh, there are some cities that are thinking about this. Fort Collins actually is going after that right now. So Fort, Fort Zed. Uh, there was a competition that the International Living Future Institute did, the Living City Competition. If you look up the Living Cities on the web under uh, ILFI, you might find some entrants, which are kind of interesting. And then there's a city in, in uh, Abu Dhabi called Mazdar City, which is from the ground up trying to be a no impact project. Uh, some other barriers. I'm not going to have time here because I'm going to finish. Insufficient time to finish. <laughs> need for education. People need to be educated about how to do these projects. We have a linear way of thinking. Engineers are guilty of that. Design fee constraints. We don't always have the money we need to do this stuff. Uh, financing becomes an obstacle when you're developer led. And then the AHJ, the local building restrictions, you know, putting that, that wind turbine on top of your building. So, now, my last slide the inspiration slide is leveraging local resources, knowing what you have in abundance and using that. So this is a guy delivering vaccines across the Sahara Desert. And the vaccines need to be kept at a cool temperature. And he's got a camel. So what he's got on there is a solar powered refrigerator. And by that, he's able to keep the vaccines cool during the daytime. And then at night, when it cools off of the Sahara, it's OK. You know, he might have a little battery there, but he can get away with it. So this is all about seeing where you are, thinking where you are, making choices where you are now. And that's it. And I'm out of time, probably, so I don't have time for questions, but if they don't kick us out. So if we want to, if the guys need to class here, we can go next door. I think I see someone lingering outside there. I do have a short question, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, seen recently, uh, two things, actually. One where uh, the flat panel solar panels mm -hmm. are inefficient when you compare it to, say, how a tree or a bush does things. Oh, absolutely, so yeah. I saw recently where, I don't know, some junior higher to come up with a different kind of setup that basically breaks it out the same way a tree would, and it, it increased efficiency like 75% or 80%. Crazy amount. So it, well, yeah, I mean, they, they capture the photosynthesis. They're capturing a whole lot more of that energy, right? Right, and a lot of that was because of the way the panels were actually laid out. He actually did the test where he took his little, you know, right. spent like 50 bucks to put a parts and put it together, and he ended up with that much that increase. That's so, cool. I, the question is whether or not you guys are starting to look at being able to do So, so I, I, I used to work as a building researcher. It's something to really be into that building science and that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, now I'm an applications engineer working on buildings. And so we, we very rarely get to do the fun stuff like that. We have to work within our applied technologies that we can go buy. Yeah, exactly. So that's one of the owner, and you have to show owner stuff that can work now. Which is that sometimes a chicken and egg thing when you're doing innovation because maybe it works great in Europe, but gee, it's, we don't do things like that over here, right? And uh, I see it run into that kind of stuff a lot. So, but you also so it, find products that are available on the market that can find people who know how to maintain them, and then the project can afford. So you got those constraints to deal with when you're dealing with these kind of buildings. If you want to do it at scale, you know, we're trying to lead the way in pushing the pushing the boundary and showing you can do these things. All of a sudden, makes things that are tough to do today, when you're pushing the edges, you know, maybe everything moves over there. And so the, the middle of the the middle of the road becomes the standard in the future, which is where we're at today with the aggressive end. So that's kind of what we're always looking at, trying to push things that way. Right. So what I see, even in this short conversation, is that right now it's, uh, there's uh, a philosophy of why we can't do it. And yes, it's very pragmatic, but where does that line start to blur? Where do you guys start to make that transition to, OK, that's a really great idea. How do we actually make this happen? So one thing that helps is when you have a state like California that's being very progressive and looking for net zero, and they were very progressive in terms of uh, getting low VOC materials going and stuff and putting that in their regulations, they're a big economy. And so if you have, and I'm not, I'm not saying regulation is the only answer, but when you have people tossing out things like that, 
the, the, the manufacturers, the people that are creating products see that. And that will actually drive some of the innovation to become more mainstream. Because if you have, if they see 10 years from now, if you want to do business in California, you have to be net zero. They're going to find figure it out. stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. So well, I'm not 100% of technologists. I have some faith that products will improve because they're going to go in the direction that the regulations and the standards take them. So you know, if you can start to drive things, if you have to be net zero, you have to find a way. Technologies to get you there are going to start popping up. They're going to make it easier. Please go. Yeah. 